Six weeks ago, the House of Commons in Canada passed the Bill of Rights. This was presumably to help to safeguard our rights against an encroaching state and against the encroaching complexities of our society. But rather than prejudge the issue, we have the man who can tell us about that, and I'm going to address my first question directly to him. Mr. Fulton, what was the thinking behind the Bill of Rights? Why was it passed at this last session of Parliament? Well, there are a number of reasons I could give, but I'll, I'll try and give you just two or three of the main ones. <clears throat> the first is one that you have yourself mentioned, and that is the increasing complexity of government and the fact that government now enters into the private life and affairs affecting the private welfare of individuals in ways in which it never used to do, say, 50 years or more ago. So it seemed to us important uh, then to uh, have legislation on our statute books outlining the rights and freedoms of an individual against which a government could not encroach. Uh, Are these new, or is this merely a formalization of what has already existed? No, we haven't pretended that we're creating a vast number of new rights. We're, we're reducing to legislative and concrete form, thus giving them that much more protection, rights which we have always taken for granted in Canada. <clears throat> that leads me into the second reason, and that is that uh, <clears throat> to, a, to a great extent, if not completely, we in Canada, while possessing and enjoying these rights and freedoms, have possessed them by what I might call the accident of inheritance. Mm. No one is prouder than, than I am <clears throat> of the fact that we do inherit the British constitutional system and the principles of the British common law. But <clears throat> there are many thousands, if not millions, of Canadians now who have come from countries where these principles are not necessarily known. Um, so that for that reason, it seemed, in, it seemed desirable to have our own declaration of rights um, <clears throat> in order that they might form part of, a, of Canadian legislation rather than really being enjoyed by the accident of inheritance. And thirdly, uh, it seemed to us that in the kind of world in which we're now living, um, where <clears throat> there is an ideological battle uh, in process, that it was important that Canada should define what we mean as Canadians by rights and freedoms. Um, at a time when the word freedom itself is being, I think, distorted uh, by communist uh, ideologists and propagandists who claim that they are free, it seemed to us that a nation like Canada might well set an example, if not for the world, at least for ourselves, uh, by <laughs> defining what we mean by freedom. So that even although our definition of rights and freedoms imposed some administrative inconvenience on government, we should declare to the world that we were prepared to accept that administrative inconvenience because we set at the pinnacle the rights and freedoms which we have now written into our Canadian statute as a Canadian Bill of Rights. That was the sort of reasoning behind our decision and the Prime Minister's decision to introduce the Bill of Rights as a Canadian statute. Well, Mr. Rondell, you have in the United States a written constitution and Bill of Rights. Is this the... Would you say these are some of the reasons why you have one too, or is this not applicable? No, I think it's not applicable at all because ours was uh, written 170 years ago in the face of uh, a war, or in the memory of a war, which I won't refer to here with our <laughs> good friends. But if I may, I'd like to say three things about this new Canadian Bill of Rights. Yes. First, it is very much like our Constitutional Bill of Rights in most of the things which it purports to protect against. There are minor uh, things which we have in our Bill of Rights and you don't. There are minor things which you have and we don't. But essentially, though ours is in the Constitution or the Basic Charter, and yours is legislative, which I gather means it may be repealed at any time as ours cannot, their purpose is the same, and their purpose is, of course, laudable. Second, I'd like to say that the Bill of Rights is just as worthless as ours is. It is worthless because it is nothing but words on paper until men put it into action. I've marked a few phrases in it. There is a prohibition against arbitrary detention, imprisonment, exile, etc. Who is to decide what is arbitrary? There is a requirement that someone arrested must be informed promptly of the reason. Who's going to say what is promptly? There is a requirement that you can't deprive a person of a right to a fair hearing, and what does fair mean? In accordance with the principles of fundamental justice, and who is to say what fundamental justice is? Is it the cop on the corner, 
or is it probably the judges? Our late Chief Justice Hughes once said, we are under a constitution, but the constitution is what the judges say it is. For that reason, I say, essentially, the words of your Bill of Rights, like the words of our Bill of Rights, are worthless without men who will put it into effect in a decent way. But I would say, third, that it's a very hopeful sign. I'm glad you enacted it for this uh, rather practical, I think, reason. When you do get a liberal judge faced with a complaint under either your or our Bill of Rights, he has in these words a lawyer's excuse to act in a liberal way, something which he might not have had if he had not written this in the law. And that, to me, is the real value of both your and our bills of rights. Well, you, pointed out some of the, uh, uh, you pointed out some of the shortcomings in your view. Is this perhaps, Mr. McGarry, why the, uh, the British do not have a, a, a written bill of rights? Well, we have a bill of rights. We had one in 1689. I think ours is the oldest bill of rights. But what really matters, of course, is the individual acts of parliament that are passed each each year by each of the parliaments. Uh, do you have acts of parliament that have written into them a real protection for the subject? That's what really matters. And general statements in a Bill of Rights uh, are good as pointing the way to the sort of things that ought to be enforced by the law. But what really matters is the individual acts of parliament and also, I should have thought, what the courts actually do. Would you and I, I'd agree with Rodell entirely that uh, this is good as giving an excuse for a judge who wants to do justice in a difficult case. But one must look at the other side of the penny also. Uh, all acts of Parliament passed in Canada up to date have now got to be scrutinized in the light of this Bill of Rights. Uh, the arguments that can be fought up by any ingenious lawyer as to how some existing act of Parliament uh, conflicts with this Bill of Rights are almost innumerable. And just how much extra litigation this is going to result in, I, as an Englishman, wouldn't like to say, sitting here in Canada. <laughs> May I ask well, English, well, Mr. Question, Fulton wanted to get his uh, war again. Yeah. There, there are two things that should be said. I, I was impressed um, and, of course, aroused by Professor O'Dell's comment on our bill being as worthless as the American Bill of Rights. I would think that the more correct way of uh, stating it is that our bill is as worthy as the American Bill of Rights. And the American Bill of Rights has, I think, indisputably, uh, been used and been the foundation of the a good many of the heads of the liberty of the subject in the United States. Secondly, I couldn't accept um, without challenge uh, Mr. McGarry's statement that um, um, what is going to happen depends entirely upon the legislation introduced, the subsequent legislation introduced in Parliament and the extent to which safeguards are written there because the Canadian Bill of Rights, um, by express provision, uh, lays down to the courts a rule of interpretation which they, will impl which they will apply in dealing with statutes previously enacted and with statutes subsequently enacted, unless those statutes expressly provide that they shall have effect notwithstanding the Bill of Rights. Uh, the effect particularly of this latter provision is that no right can be overridden by Parliament, by stealth, or by inadvertence. It has to be expressly provided in the statute, the right or liberty sought to be taken away shall be taken away notwithstanding the Bill of Rights. And of course, all uh, this Bill of Rights, just as every other statute of our legislation under our system, uh, is subject to the interpretation of the courts. Uh, so that uh, given the system of a free and independent judiciary, uh, then the courts are the final, the, the, the final protection of the rights and liberties of the subject. That, uh, that I accept. May I? Question, while I admire your optimism, Mr. Fulton, uh, we have a, had a written bill, bill of Rights in the Constitution, as you know. I think the strongest and most unqualified statement in our Bill of Rights is in the First Amendment, which says, among other things, that Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or the press. That's a stronger statement even than in yours, though you cover the same subjects. Despite that constitutional uh, guarantee or prohibition, as you will. Our Congress has passed laws from almost its very beginning, including particularly the Smith Communist Controlling Act, which was passed some years ago, 
and those laws clearly abridge the freedom of speech and press, and those laws have been upheld by a majority of our Supreme Court over the valiant dissents of people like Holmes and Brandeis in the old days, Black and Douglas today. I doubt very seriously that your courts, unless they are far more courageous than ours seem to be, are going to overthrow acts of your legislature.